A man has gone on trial. The jury has been warned the case may take between six and nine months. It's a very intense atmosphere. It took the jury a couple of days to come to a verdict. The verdict was guilty. Over the last two decades, Scotland has witnessed many emotional courtroom moments, from family-led campaigns... What's going to explain how I feel? All we wanted was justice, and we were very scared. ..to high court drama. This case has been controversial and high-profile from the start. Trials that grip the nation. Probably the most tiring deal of any high court trial I've ever covered. And decisions that altered the legal system forever. Scottish law had to be changed in order to make this possible. In this episode, a murder investigation that spanned the country and a jury pushed to its limits. Are you filming me? These are the trials that shocked Scotland. Tuesday morning rush hour in Scotland's capital. The city centre was bustling with people on their way to work. One commuter who should have been arriving at the office was Suzanne Pilly, a 38-year-old who lived in Edinburgh where she worked as a bookkeeper. Her work colleagues had said she hadn't turned up at work that day and had called her family. The family had gone round to check if Suzanne was at home and discovered that there was no obvious sign that she'd, you know, gone anywhere but to work as she would normally do. And clearly that's highly unusual and that's probably, you know, there, there's a catalyst for the police to become involved quickly. Using CCTV footage, police established that on the morning of the 4th of May 2010, Suzanne had made her way to work as normal. Every day, Suzanne would get the bus to work from her house in Sockton. She would come off the bus at Princess Street and she would have to walk round into St Andrew's Square. Effectively, she's seen uh, 60 metres from her office door. There's no other opportunity, there's no side streets, there's nowhere where she can go. She's got to walk past that door. If she walks past that door, she appears in another camera. She never appeared. Within a week, Gary and his team of detectives launched a huge missing persons investigation. If you think you may have seen her on her way to work, please stop to have a quick word with the officers nearby. I have a team of 60 officers working in this case, but this today is about doing all we possibly can to ensure that we get Suzanne back safe and well to her family. Suzanne Pilly was a, you know, a, a very much loved and respected uh, lady, very, very close to her mum and dad, Robin Sylvia, and her, her sister, Gail. And she was clearly somebody who was very popular, had lots of friends. After two weeks of searching for Suzanne, there was a dramatic development in the investigation. Police investigating the disappearance of Edinburgh woman Suzanne Pilly are now hunting a killer. At this moment, uh, our investigation is led to believe that uh, Suzanne has uh, been murdered, and that is obviously progressing our inquiry somewhat at the moment. I can't go into uh, other specifics at, the mo at this moment in time. Our investigations that have been ongoing for some time uh, are leading us to believe that uh, that is the case. Soon after this announcement, the police investigation shifted 100 miles from Edinburgh to the Argyll Forest on the west coast. This stunning Argyll scenery may be hiding something much more sinister. The police believe the body of Suzanne Pilly may have been dumped here by her murderer. If they've seen a vehicle parked unattended in an isolated place um, on an unclassified road, then tell us about the sighting. Police had also discovered that before her disappearance, Suzanne and a colleague had been having an affair. A man who spent the day being questioned by police investigating the suspected murder of Edinburgh woman Suzanne Pilly has just been telling reporters he had nothing to do with her disappearance. Within the last hour, David Gilroy, Suzanne Pilly's former boyfriend, spoke outside his home. Police asked me to voluntarily go back again today, which I did and uh, assisted the police again today, as they're doing with other people. There clearly is a belief in some quarters that you are a murderer, that you killed Suzanne Pilly. What do you say to that? Well, that's not the case, and uh, the police will, will do their investigation and time will show that, you know, I don't have anything to answer to. David Gilroy and Suzanne Pilly had worked in the same office for 18 months. 
He was married and lived with his family in northwest Edinburgh, but had been having an affair with Suzanne for nearly a year. The police investigation continued in Argyll, a massive search area covering 400 square miles of rural terrain. We didn't think we were going to see it again. And I'd just like to get in the bottom of it, find out where she is and what's happened to her. On the 23rd of June 2010, seven weeks after Suzanne's disappearance, the police investigation took another dramatic turn when her ex-partner was detained by police. We were left with no conclusion that Suzanne had made it to work that day and she'd been murdered in the basement, and that from that point on, all Gilroy's actions were to conceal Suzanne, to take her away. We, we have every reason to believe that, that he took her to, the, the, to Argyle and uh, disposed of her somewhere in Argyle Forest. Later that day, Gilroy was charged with the murder of Suzanne. While preparations began for the trial, Lothian and Borders Police continued to search for her body. I, I just keep on thinking that it's, it's, it's going to be another one of these things that is going to go on. You're never, we're never ever going to find the body. Or 10 or 15 years later, we come across a body and is going to be left up to my, the rest of my family to lay it out because I'll probably not be here to do it myself. Despite Suzanne's body not being found, police and the Crown Office were convinced they had enough evidence to proceed to a trial, which began in Edinburgh on the 20th of February 2012. David Gilroy was accused of the murder of Suzanne Pilly and then defeating the ends of justice by concealing her body, and he pled not guilty to those charges. The prosecutor in this case was Alec Prentice QC. Now, he's a really, really respected, he's Scotland's top prosecutor. No matter how experienced you are, there's, there are always nerves about making sure everything's in place, everything's ready. It, it's a very intense atmosphere, especially the first day of the trial. Murder trials without a body are uncommon and present particular challenges for the prosecution. In a case where the prosecution allege murder, but the body is not recovered, then we have to prove, first of all, the person is dead, and secondly, that the person died as a result of a murderous attack. In modern times, it is actually very difficult to be alive and function in society without having any trace whatsoever. It was important for the prosecution to build up a credible body of evidence against Gilroy. Circumstantial evidence is evidence which, of itself, does not directly prove the, the commission of the crime. It is the combination of the circumstantial evidence which provides a compelling picture. Sometimes circumstantial evidence is likened to a cable where you have individual strands. So an individual strand might be very weak, but when they're combined together, and the more there are, then the stronger the cable will become. Much of the prosecution evidence presented to the jury consisted of electronic information gathered during the police investigation. There's CCTV cameras all around us. We leave a digital footprint wherever we go. But this was really the first time that I had seen this brought together in such a compelling way to piece together not only the last movements of the victim, but also the subsequent movements of the accused. The jury was shown CCTV footage from the 4th of May 2010. Just before 9am, Suzanne appeared on camera for the last time, metres from her office. At 10.30am, Gilroy left the office to go home and collect his car and an hour later arrived back, parking in the basement garage. He bought air fresheners during his lunch break. Before driving home that evening, he adjusted his work diary to create an appointment at a school in Argyle the next day. Gilroy's journey from Edinburgh to Loch Gilphead became key. We were able to recreate a virtual a film of Gilroy's movements, recreating the journey from Edinburgh out to Argyll. They knew, because they had looked at mobile phone records and CCTV footage, that David Gilroy had taken 
far longer to travel to Loch Gilped to a, a school um, than he would be expected to. He didn't take a direct route, he headed much further north. CCTV showed him passing through Tyndrum and Inverary before arriving in Loch Gilped. Police recreated the journey three times. They made a crucial discovery. They drove between Tyndrum and Inverary in 40 minutes. Gilroy took almost two hours longer each way. I think part of showing that to the jury was to suggest that on this journey, in, at some point in this kind of missing tour window each way, that David Gilroy may have driven up a country track or off-road somewhere, and that's where they think he potentially disposed of Suzanne Pilly's body. The jury also heard about the condition of Gilroy's Vauxhall Vectra, which was searched by police in the days after Suzanne's disappearance. The car was later recovered, which had damage underneath. There were three broken suspension coils and vegetation caught underneath the car, all of which suggested that that car had been driven off-road somewhere. One of the other things I remember being quite striking about this trial was that there wasn't any DNA evidence, and that was going to be really difficult for the prosecution to convince the jury that David Gilroy had put Suzanne's body in the boot of his car after murdering her at work. The trial heard that police used cadaver dogs specially trained to identify the smell of human remains. The Springer Spaniels identified three areas of interest in the office's basement garage and two areas in Gilroy's car boot. We had the evidence of the turbulent nature of the relationship between the accused and Suzanne Pilly. The jury was told that Gilroy's affair with Suzanne had ended just days before she went missing. He had sent Suzanne more than 400 texts and voicemails in the weeks before she disappeared. Hi Suzanne, it's David here. Uh, give me a phone back, please. I just want to have a wee chat with you. Um, you know, see if you need a lift or anything. Just give me a phone back, even just for a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, you know, I'm worried. Gilroy was bombarding her with texts and phone calls until the point that she arrives at work that morning and it ceased completely. So it dro dropped off a cliff. There was no further calls made. Uh, which, and again, it's, in itself, is a very powerful piece of information. Whilst giving a statement just two days after Suzanne went missing, police took photographs of David Gilroy's hands and arms. These images were shown to the jury. Under questioning, a pathologist stated it was impossible to be certain about exactly how and when the injuries had been inflicted. The Home Office pathologist said were indicative of fingernail marks of a type he had seen in cases of known strangulation and the accused had placed makeup over the injuries in an attempt, the Crown said, to conceal those injuries. Seventeen days after calling their first witness, the prosecution case ended. It was the turn of Gilroy's defence. His QC, Jack Davidson, called several witnesses. David Gilroy's lawyer said that after seeking legal advice, he had chosen not to give evidence in this trial. Instead, the defence called a number of witnesses who'd been in the offices of 11 Thistle Street on the morning that Suzanne Pilly went missing. An estate agent and a charity manager had been viewing the empty basement of the property around about 9.30 that morning. They said that they hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary during their visit. The following day, on the 13th of March, the jury retired for deliberation. Waiting for the verdict's always a very tense moment. As a prosecutor, my role is really finished. Uh, there's no more I can do. It's entirely a matter for the jury to determine, and we await the verdict. What I do remember is it took the jury a couple of days to come to a verdict, and that is horrendous for a family. The verdict was, was guilty. Finally, Suzanne's received the justice she deserved. As a family, we continue to struggle to come to terms with losing her. Although the trial has ended, our ordeal goes on, and we hope that one day we can lay our daughter to rest. The relief of the guilty 
the verdict is tinged with the, the sadness that you've not got closure for the family. The trial attracted significant public interest and for the first time in Scottish legal history, permission was granted for the sentencing to be filmed. I sentence you to life imprisonment. I order that you serve a punishment part of 18 years with quite chilling calmness and calculation you set about the task and but for the commendably thorough investigation conducted by the Lothian and Borders Police, you might well have been successful in avoiding detection and prosecution. Gilroy continues to maintain his innocence and has unsuccessfully appealed against his conviction. Police Scotland are still looking for information to assist them in the search to find Suzanne's body. The police will never give up um, in, you know, the, the search for Suzanne. If there's any credible piece of information, Police Scotland will do whatever it takes to, um, you know, to, to, to try and find Suzanne. I always remember um, Suzanne Pilly's dad, Rob, saying to me when I interviewed him once that the door was always ajar, but he wanted that door to be closed. And really sadly, um, Rob Pilly uh, passed away and he's never ever found out what happened to his daughter's body. On an autumn morning in Glasgow, Edwin and Lorraine McLaren appear at the High Court to face over 30 charges of fraud. The trial was the culmination of one of the largest and most complicated investigations ever conducted in Scotland and would become the longest trial in UK history. Are you filming these? The McLaren case was a bit of a slow burner because I don't think a lot of people recognised the significance of it when it first came to court. And as the case went on, that's really when it became apparent it was going to be a significant fraud case. The McLarens were tried or between them on a number of counts of fraud. It's a, a very complex web of criminality, but it really boiled down to conning people out of, in some cases, their home and in some cases, their money. The couple lived in the exclusive Quarriers village in Renfrewshire, where no one suspected the darker side of their seemingly successful businesses. Lorraine worked as an estate agent and was the director of a string of property companies. Her husband Edwin was a financial advisor and entrepreneur. Edwin McLaren had a number of different businesses. He had a laundrette and he had property businesses, um, a number of different names. You know, you look at photos of him and his wife, smiling, happy. The McLarens enjoyed a lavish lifestyle. Edwin McLaren was very much a sort of pinstripe suit, flamboyant, scatter cash type of guy, driving his Bentley Continental. I mean, his, his wife had a £100,000 diamond ring, a £750,000 house. I mean, they've got a jet-setting lifestyle. In the aftermath of the financial crisis of the late 2000s, with banks tightening their rules around borrowing, it left many people struggling to access cash. For the McLarens, this was an opportunity. I think that that creates an environment where, pe where people like McLaren can flourish because people are desperate and people are looking for solutions to their money worries. I think you'd probably describe him as a bit of a cowboy financial advisor who looked at the aftermath of 2008 and said, this is rich picking, so I can make a fortune here. The McLarens had taken people who were at rock bottom, people who were unwell, who had really serious mental health conditions. It was people who were in really, really desperate situations and couldn't see a way out. And then in walks Edwin McLaren, and he's like their saviour. He told people that he was going to arrange extra loans or equity release or, or further advances on the properties they had to help them with the money problems that they had, and he basically stole their houses. And that's what property fraud is. It's about somebody taking your house from you and uh, under the guise of helping you out. 
When the trial got underway, the prosecution laid out the inner workings of the McLaren's fraudulent scheme. The court heard that Edwin set up two new companies, Property Solutions and Home Sales Solutions. He hooked people in with newspaper ads, targeting those in debt and offering solutions to all their money problems. Here he is in action at a bank. The homeowner thinks Mr McLaren is paying money into her account, but the court found he had sold her house and little did she know he wasn't putting money in but taking it out, helping himself to the proceeds of the house sale. To stop his victims becoming suspicious, McLaren would often provide some of the money owed, but never close to the amount promised. Lorraine denied any involvement in defrauding people. Her defence told the court that she just signed the documents when her husband asked her to. The jury heard how the con had worked for over four years until a woman from Fife reported Edwin McLaren to the police for failing to pay her what she was owed. A lot of people at this stage weren't really aware that they had been scammed. They weren't aware that they no longer owned their own homes. So it was really that slow uncovering of this bigger picture, which all started with one woman in five. Following the tip-off, police began their investigation in 2012 and amassed a huge number of documents which were then presented in court. Financial fraud tends to be very complex. A huge number of people involved, a huge amount of documentation involved, which is why the trial took so long to come to a conclusion. Listening to the dozens of victim testimonies, the jury heard that many were left penniless, homeless and desperate at the hands of the McLarens. Each one had an incredibly strong story to tell. I saw people who were living in really quite abject poverty people whose mental health was a, a real struggle from day to day, um, couples who were really embarrassed to even tell their family members that anything like this had ever happened to them. In the case of one couple, Edwin McLaren turned up here at the Beetson Cancer Centre to get a document signed. The homeowner said he was so weakened by his cancer treatment, he didn't even know what the document was. It turns out that he and his wife were signing over their house. I mean, that's pretty low. The trial of Edwin and Lorraine McLaren sat for a record-breaking 20 months. The idea that a jury will sit on a case for, what, more than two Christmases, um, over 300 days, is really an unusual one. I mean, it's unlikely to happen, but for jurors in this case, it, it was what happened. You've got um, one of the lawyers went away to have a baby and actually came back from maternity leave and the trial was still going on. You got a juror who went off to get married and go on honeymoon. The whole court had to break. Judge Lord Stewart actually turned 70 halfway through the, the, the trial and had to get special dispensation to continue sitting as a judge. During the long proceedings, three jurors had to drop out, leaving only 12 of the original 15. Under Scots law, you can keep going so long as there are at least 12 at least 12, but if you fall below that, then effectively the trial diet simply has to be deserted. The case comes to a close, you don't have enough jurors to make a fair verdict. So in this case, they were really down to the wire. The months leading up to the verdict it just added that apprehension, because can you imagine if after all that time, the trial came to nothing? The McLaren trial raised some difficult questions within Scotland's legal system. This isn't a jury of accountants. Maybe there's a case for having non-jury trials in complex fraud cases. The counter-argument, of course, is these are serious cases with serious consequences for people who are convicted. We have trial by jury for a reason, and if you're going to face a serious jail term at the end of it, many people would argue it's only right a jury of your peers take that decision rather than unelected judges. Throughout the trial, Edwin and Lorraine protested their innocence, but on the 16th of May 2017, Britain's longest-serving jury delivered its verdict. Husband and wife have been found guilty of fraud after the longest trial in UK criminal history. Edwin McLaren was convicted of 29 charges relating to property fraud and money laundering. Lorraine McLaren was convicted of two charges, 
one of money laundering and one of mortgage fraud. While Edwin was described as the driving force, the judge said Lorraine must have known that the money transferred into her bank account came from the proceeds of crime. I spoke to some of the victims after the verdict and they were obviously delighted that they felt justice had been served. That's not the end of the process for them though. It doesn't mean to say they get their money back or their house back. Um, so there was a, a long civil process ahead of them to try and get financial recompense. As far as the family are concerned, Edwin McLaren is pure and utter scum who basically just preys on people who are a low ebb. He comes in like the knight in shining armour and then just basically screws them over by getting them to sign their house over to him. The wife wasn't well. Uh, I was just, I just signed it, I didn't read it. Oh, so it was a great guy. Best guy I've ever met, sort of thing. No, really down, yeah. And, and as far down as I've ever been in life. Yeah. A month later, the McLarens were back at the High Court for sentencing. I am satisfied that the jurors, or a majority of them, rejected your evidence on the critical issues because they have found you to be an outright liar. Edwin was sentenced to 11 years in jail, and Lorraine was sentenced to two and a half years in jail. Under the Proceeds of Crime Act, the Crown pursued the McLarens to recover stolen money and property. The McLarens have been involved in a, a long-running dispute with the, the Crown over exactly how much money they made off their criminal enterprise. The Crown finally settled on £2.4 million. In 2021, four years after their convictions, Edwin was ordered to pay back £4,000 and Lorraine £4,213, nowhere near what was stolen. So you can only really chase down as a prosecutor what assets these people have kept in their bank for the rainy day, and in their case it appears to be limited to just a few thousand pounds. We'll need to wait and see what happens to Edwin um, McLaren when he comes out of jail. My, my personal opinion is he's the sort of guy he'll disappear and I'll be sent over to Dubai in a couple of years' time to track him down.